put patent pending on there thing and thinking that it means something, and it, it doesn't. It simply means, all it means is that you've spent $10,000 to file a patent application. That's all it means. So you have no protection. So let's, let's do the patent timeline here, and we'll make it very, very clear how, I'm not anti-patent. What I'm telling you is that it's very unusual for somebody like us in this room to need or be able to use or enforce or ever make money off of a patent. I'm not going to say don't ever get a patent for your stuff you make, but let's talk about what that means to have a patent. Okay, here we go. So, at this point in time, today, you file a patent application. So you're out $8,000 and you get to say patent pending. That is all. And so when people see your device or your thing and they see patent pending on it, they know that you filed a patent application, but they also know that they may use it with impunity, complete impunity. No attribution, no payment to you, no recourse. You have zero recourse because it's merely patent pending. Then, 18 months later, the patent is published, which means that your patent, which has a specific recipe on how you do your thing, let's assume you have a, a super, really, really cool way of printing, Julianne, some method that you've come up with that's potentially patentable. You want to get a patent on it. Okay. You spend eight grand, your invention is patent pending. 18 months later, this secret way that you do it becomes published for everybody in the world to see. Everybody in the world to see. So quite literally, what that means is that on a Tuesday morning, 18 months after you file your patent application, this will be published. And anybody in the world with a web browser can go to USPTO.gov and see your patent application and see how you do it and steal your idea with complete impunity. It's free R&D for the rest of the world. It's kind of a joke. Every Tuesday morning, the servers at USPTO.gov light up from all over the world because inventors in Japan, Brazil, Belize, Canada, Mexico, they're all looking to see what, what's being published today because they know they can steal it and use it with complete impunity. We all know it. It's just kind of a joke, but we all know that, right? Okay, so 18 months later, it's published. Everybody in the world gets to use your invention with complete impunity, including people in the United States. Now we go out 18 more months and we're out three years. And now you've invested probably a total of, I don't know, 15K, probably. Because, you know, during this period of time called the prosecution period, you've got to spend more money with your patent attorney arguing with the examining attorney at the patent office to get this thing issued. And then three years later, you get one of those things in the mail, the thing that had the guy with the hair. You've got an issued patent in the mail. Issued. Then what happens? <clears throat> then what happens? Do people just stop making your thing, Dean? No, it's good. Do they just start sending the checks, Julianne? No. As I said a minute ago, all this is is a license to go sue people for patent infringement. You can't sue them before this point in time. So day one, I steal your idea because I see it at a maker fair. And I see patent anyone. Anyway. So what? I use it, I steal it, I use it, no attribution with complete impunity for three years. While you wait, wait, every day checking the mailbox, waiting for your patent issue. And then when it finally issues, do I stop? No. You've got to go find me, you've got to sue me, and you've got to win. You know how long that takes? Two years. You know how much that costs? A quarter of a million dollars. <laughs> that's just one infringer, me. What about Dean when he infringes? You've got to go sue him, so that's 500. And then when Carol infringes, that's another 250. And then when, when <laughs> Jen infringes, that's another 250. And so on and so on and so on. And Julian, that's just the US. What about all the infringers in all the other countries in the world? So I'm not anti-patent, but you can see they have a limited utility, a limited role here. So who gets patents? Apple gets patents, because Apple can afford to wait for three years, and as soon as it issues, they just go and they hammer everybody. They just start suing people. They don't care. They've got the money. So when people, if somebody was stupid enough to copy a patent-pending Apple invention, well, they might be able to squeeze three years of money out of it, but they know they're going to get hammered on as soon as the patent issues. But to be clear, yes, they may keep the money. They get to keep it, all that they make during that three-year period. Keep it, as long as they what? stop before the patent issues. Questions about patents? Sir? So you're, uh, you're able to uh, sue back to your application date? No, absolutely not, just the converse. You're able to only sue once the patent issues. All of these acts are forgiven it's as, as if they never occurred. As long as an infringer stops one day before the patent issues, you have no remedy against that infringer. A lot of patents take longer than three years to issue. Is there, if I was the infringer, 
right? And I know this patent's been filed because I saw a call, which is there a way to, to know when it might be issued or what yes. state it's in? So I, I can keep an eye on it for you know, however many years it takes, right? Well said, sir. That's exactly what people do. A smart infringer will know exactly when the patent's going to issue and then just stop <laughs> the day before and keep all that money from your invention for free. You have no recourse with complete impunity. Maybe it's your idea. Isn't that horrible? <clears throat> Sir. Uh, fairly different question. Is, it, is just simply making it an infringement, even if you don't sell it to anybody? Yes. Right? Dean does the mousetrap. I make it, I use it at home. Yes. Am I infringing? Very good, yes, the answer is yes. Let's talk more about that. Now that I've beaten you out of ever have, wanting to have a patent, I know, unless you have a quarter of a million dollars to go sue somebody for infringement. I mean, seriously, guys. All right, so, so to, to your question, infringement of a patent arises through making, using, or selling the patented article. So there's a term of art in, in law called scienter, S-C-I-E-N-T-E-R, it just means knowledge. There's no scienter requirement for patent infringement. So a garage inventor, literally, who has no internet connectivity, who just is in his garage every night inventing stuff, makes Dean's mousetrap, that's patent infringement. And Dean, if Dean could find that person, could sue them. But the question becomes for Dean, the does the infringer have any money? Right? Is Dean really going to spend 250 grand just to chase this guy into bankruptcy? Mm -hmm. So there is no, so, so let's flip it now 180 degrees. Each of you could commit patent infringement unknowingly because it's not sell. There's no commercial aspect to patent infringement. Make, use, or sell. So if you see something at a maker fair or see something on the internet and go, that's cool, and you make it, if that thing is subject to an issued patent, you have committed patent infringement. That's all it takes. And there's no way to know, right? I mean, well, you can go look. You can go look on USPTO.gov, Dean. So what if, um I come up with a, 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 a great tech idea, yep. and I think this is a, a legally defensible thing, that, it, that there's, there's value in pursuing uh, copyright protections, or okay, I'm sorry, sorry. Patent, patent protections. Right. Um, so Dean, is your invention, let's put it in the right terms, your invention is new, useful, and non-obvious, right. such that you might be able to get an issued United States patent. Right. Okay. Now, somebody someplace uh, sees 18 months later, it gets published. They see it, and they immediately begin producing versions of it that they sell. Yep. Yes. 18 months later, my patent gets issued. Right. Uh, the, the person who was fabricating the devices, whatever they were, stops the day before. Correct. So they're no longer liable for copyright infringement. Patent. Patent. I'm sorry, patent infringement. But they, they sold 10,000 units uh -huh. that are out there still being used. Right. Those 10,000 users, are they committing patent infringement? That's a very good question. The answer is yes. Because they're using your patented article without your permission. Okay. But instead of now 1 times $250,000, you've got 10,000 times $250,000 to go sue all those guys. But the answer is yes. 25 million. They're all infringing. Yeah, they are. Okay, let's work through the patent caveats here. We've talked about patent pending. You know it means nothing. It means copy it quick because you can use it with complete impunity until the patent issues, if at all. If at all. It may not have been, the patent may never issue you guys. Not a slam dunk, right? It, it simply may never issue. There's something called the on sale bar doctrine that says if for some reason you decide you want to file a patent application, you must do so within one year after the article is offered for sale. And if you, can, if you wait more than one year after the article is offered for sale, you may not file a patent application. It's called the one-year on-sale bar. This actually changes in March of 2013. That one-year grace period goes away. So in March of 2013, if you're going to get a patent, you've got to file the application before it goes on sale. With any public offering at all, March of 2013 is a critical date in patent law. Beware the Walmart and Google prior art search. And by that, I mean people will come to me and they say, I want to get a patent on this. And I give them my patent talk, and then they don't want to get a patent on it. But nonetheless, if they still want to get a patent, I say, is it new? That's the test. Remember, new, useful, and non-obvious? And they go, well, yeah, it's new. I've looked on the internet. You can't find it. I've been to Walmart. I've been on Google. I can't find it. It's new. No. Here's the definition of, see the words I use on the second, third bullet there, prior art? What that means is, in order for your invention to be new and patentable, it means that nobody else anywhere in the history of the world, anywhere in the world, has ever thought of your idea before and written it down. It's called conception and reduction to practice. That's prior art. 
So it's got to be new. So my favorite example is, so in 1989, some guy in Dusseldorf, Germany, writing his PhD dissertation, described your invention. That's prior art. Your invention is not new, and you cannot get a patent anywhere in the world, especially Germany, not the U.S. Patents are only ter they're territorially, territorially circumscribed. It should be made plain now. They only work in the country of issuance. So you get a patent on something in the United States, even if you have an issued patent. Some guy comes down from Canada. We're close to Canada. He comes, he sees your patented article, he goes back to Canada. He makes, uses, or sells your thing with complete impunity because you don't have a patent in Canada. Or Mexico, or France. Not effective until they issue at all. I think we beat that up pretty well. Claims are the key. By that I mean a patent is governed by its claims. Let me just go back to that real quick. You can see right here, I didn't put all of them in, but see right there at the bottom it says five claims. If we had included the claims, you would have said that he claims a method for combing the hair over in three ways. And the claims delimit the scope of the patent. Some of you may be familiar with the concept of trespass in real property. If you walk on somebody else's property without their permission, that's called trespass. You all know what trespass is, yes? You should. I mean, come on, you guys know what trespass is. You, sir, know what trespass is. I know you do. I'm going to wait until you nod your head and give you some acknowledgement. Okay, good. Thank you. So, we define trespass by a description of the real property. So what is your name? Noel. No. So Noel owns this chunk of land right here. No, this is Noel's chunk of land. He owns it. Okay. When I step on it, that's trespass. It just is. Noel can sue me. When I move off of it, it's not trespass. How will the jury know if it's trespass? How will they know? Because Noel says, how do they know this is trespass? This is now where I wait until I get the right answer, because I got all the time. Because he's posted a sign. No. No? No. Because you're physically on his property. How, how do you know it's his property? Because he, he says so. There you go. Julianne gets the prize because there was a survey done and we have something called a legal description that describes the meets and bounds of Noel's chunk of land, right? Each of you that own a home, if you own a home, there's a legal description that's associated with that real property. That's how we determine whether I've trespassed on Noel's property. We look at the legal description. A patent claim is the same thing. So. We can avoid a patent simply by not infringing the claims. This is a trifold method. I just use a quadfold method and I don't infringe. Literally, because the claims say three. I was just going to say, wouldn't you also have to have evidence? I mean, because you now have stepped off the piece of property. So, I mean, there are witnesses, but would you have to have like a photo of you on the property? Well, yes, there would need to be evidence. In fact, he would need to show by, if you want to know the answer, he would have to show by a preponderance of the evidence that I had stepped on his property. And he would either use circumstantial evidence, which means he shows my footprint to the jury, or direct evidence, which is a photo of me stepping on his property. This is now, we're talking evidence class in law school, but those, that's the answer, actually. Yeah. Very good. OK, so now, uh, we've talked a lot about patents. It's one form of intellectual property, very specific. It protects ideas and inventions, specific. Trademarks are very, very different. We don't trademark an idea for a mousetrap. See, again, my head explodes when we say those terms. A trademark is a very, very different thing. A trademark is specifically a form of commercial identification that creates in the minds of consumers source identification. Commercial identification. All right, so let me give you some examples. When I say swoosh, what do you think of? Okay, so thus by definition, here's the rubric. <coughs> Nike sells swoosh brand shoes. Swoosh is a trademark for Nike brand shoes. Source identification. Swoosh, source identification to Nike. Good. When I say Big Mac, who do you think of as the source of that hamburger? You must, you must all say it out loud. Just say it. No, just say it. That means that it has source identification. Because when you see Big Mac, you think of McDonald's as the source of that good or service. It's a trademark. Yeah. What if there isn't a source identification? When you said swoosh, I thought mermaids. Well, then, if, if there were no source identification, it would not be a trademark, by definition. When you hear, when I say lion roar in the context of filmed entertainment, what do you think of? MGM. So the lion roar is a trademark for Metro Goldwyn Mayer. And the list goes on and on and on. Anything can function as a trademark. A sound, a smell, a color, a word, a picture. When I say, when I say Bronco in the context of college athletic entertainment, what do you think? College athletic entertainment, what do you think? Boise State says Mary Givens because source identification. So a trademark is that thing that caused, oh, when, when, you, when I say caveman in the context of insurance, what do you think of? When I say gecko in the context of insurance, what do you think of? 
and on and on and on goes the list. So by definition, anything that when you see it, you think of a particular company as the source of a good or service, that functions as a trademark. Okay, so here are some... I have a question for you. Do you have yeah. to have established um, that association before you can actually go get a trademark for certain things, or can you just walk out tomorrow on a trademark, the color blue? Well, let's, yeah, let's, okay, let's, so let's, let's take a breath now. Trademark is not a verb. Trademark is a noun. A trademark right arises simply by the operation of use in commerce. That's it. It's called a common law trademark, and it arises through use. It's a noun. Be very clear about that. So when you call me, as you, hopefully you will, for free legal advice. Did you hear that? When you call me for free legal advice, do I not even get a smile from you, sir, for that? <laughs> I'm offering you free legal advice. We heard you, but maybe we just are stunned and don't believe you. <laughs> Jenny, you know this, right? Yeah. Jenny knows. This is what I do for you guys. So I'm talking wait, free legal advice. When you call me, and I make this offer at every presentation, for some reason people don't call me. It's the craziest thing. I don't know. They never call Mary. It's the craziest thing. And I'm willing to talk to you guys and answer your questions on the phone or over email. And nobody does. It drives me crazy. But anyway, um, so when you call me for your free legal advice and you say, Brad, I want to trademark this, I'll just simply hang up because you can use trademark as a verb. It's not. It's a nail. So, for example, we could right now, th this has a live internet connection, right? Let's assume hypothetically that this group goes out and we decide we're going to open a consulting business called uh, Smarty Makers. Smarty Makers, okay? We're going to have a consulting business called Smarty Makers. So we go out and we register smartymakers.com, which we can do right now from there for eight bucks, right? I'll even pay for it. We go out, we host it somewhere, we quickly throw together some HTML files, bought a bin, within a half an hour this group can have a website up and running called smartymakers.com, offering consulting services to makers, couldn't we? We, we could literally do that. Quite literally, as soon as that website goes live and people in commerce can see Smarty Makers advertising our services, guess what? We have a common law trademark. Holy cow, done deal. We don't have to pay any money to a governmental agency. We don't have to trademark anything because it's not a burger. We have a common law trademark. We can literally sue people for trademark infringement. We can borrow money against that, use it as collateral. We can sell it. It's called a common law trademark because trademark is a noun. So each of you, in your world, if you have a thing, a word, a slogan, a logo, a jingle, a smell, a color, something that describes your brand of maker services or your, your non-maker services, you have a common law trademark. It's a done deal. But you can, if you want, register that trademark with the United States Patent and Trademark Office, and that's called a registered trademark. These are some examples of people who've decided to not rely purely on common law trademark rights, as smarty makers would do. They've stopped to register these. And so, remember when I said anything can function as a trademark? Look at your screens. Notice in yellow, this is a mark having the scent of bubble gum. So now let's place this into the trademark rubric. What this literally means is that, so again, McDonald's sells Big Mac brand hamburgers. Nike sells Swoosh brand shoes. Midwest Biologicals, Midwest Biologicals sells bubblegum scented brand oil-based metal cutting fluid. Because they were able to convince the examining attorney at the trademark office that when people in this space smell bubblegum in the context of oil-based metal cutting fluid, they think of Midwest Biologicals. That's it. And so if you can make that proof to the trademark office, you can get a registered trademark. Here's another one. This is an example of a sound mark. Intel has a registered trademark in the five note progression that is the famous Intel boop, 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 Intel inside that. It's a federally registered trademark. And for any of you who do bar bets, go to bars and play trivia games or bar bets, here's the actual tonal sequence right here. Isn't that cool? So now you know the five note tonal progression of the Intel inside noise. And so they have a registered trademark. So again, the test. When people hear this sound, they think of Intel as the source of microprocessors. When people see the color blue on artificial turf in a football stadium, who do they think of as the source of that entertainment service? Yeah. So the color blue is a federally registered trademark owned by Boise State University for artificial turf in a football stadium. Quite literally, we proved to the examining attorney that when people think of blue on artificial turf, they think of Boise State as the source of entertainment services. We had to prove, I, I was the one that did this. We had to do a lot of proving to show that. 
we submitted 18,000 pieces of evidence to the examining attorney to show that when people think of blue turf, they think of Boise State. But we did, because people do. <laughs> All so over the world. Shade? Pardon me? A specific shade of blue or just blue? Well, the, the, you'll know that. Colors, blue. Color blue on our So we didn't, ha we didn't have to go as granular as like, you know, Pantone 37 or something. <laughs> now, if this were a patent, sir, we would have had to do that. Because patents require that layer, that level of granularity. Trademarks do not. Because they do different things. They're, they're different animals, right? Sir. Sure. So your evidence really could not consist of just 